there. Welcome. This is the Employment Law Show. I'm John Scholes. With me again this week, of course, Lior Sanfiru, co-founding partner, Sanfiru to Market LLP. They're the most positively reviewed law firm in the country. Lior, of course, an employment lawyer. We do this show every week and inform you of your employment law rights. They're bountiful. You have really good rights. It's all on your side, but if you don't know what they are, you can't take advantage. So we go to educate you every uh, half hour here on the show every week. Also, radio shows, which you and I have been doing for almost 10 years across the country. We'll probably get to a couple phone calls from one of our radio shows in just a bit. And any time you need to reach out after the show to Lior or a member of his team, it's simple. 1-855-821-821. 5900 help at employmentlawyer.ca. There's more websites I'm going to plug throughout the hour, but I don't want to just throw them all at you at once. Constructive dismissal, true or false? That's coming up in just a bit. We used to do this, and you used to ask me the questions, and I'd look like a fool, but now we turn the tables. I ask you everything from now on. It's in my contract, so there you go. Uh, that's coming up here in just a bit, pal. But the week that was a, a matter you've been working on, what do you got for me? Thanks, John. And uh, yes, he's a tough negotiator, this John Scholes. <laughs> oh, negotiated yeah. terms are very favorable in that contract. So we'll, we'll take it easy on you today. Right. But this show, despite the fun we're having, is a serious show because we're here to talk about rights, your legal rights, your employment law rights. We all spend so much time working. We spend more time working than we do anything else. And employment law is what governs our time at work. It's what governs our rights in one of the most important things that we do with our lives, our work, our jobs, our careers. That's why everyone has a right to know their rights, to understand what the law says, what it does, and what to do if there's a workplace problems. There's so many myths and misconceptions out there when it comes to employment law. If you go to, to Google, it could be a disaster of trying to sift through uh, the various myths and, and, and the various half-truths and incomplete information. Well, the good news is, on this show, you don't have to worry about it. On this show, we're going to tell you what you need to know, what your rights are, we'll explain what to do if there's a workplace problem, if you lost your job, or worried about losing your job, if you're being mistreated, if you're in a situation where you have a medical issue and it's impacting your work, whatever the issue, this is the time where we discuss that and we help you and we arm you with the knowledge that you need to have. And of course, on this show, all I can do is give you some information. If you want me to roll up my sleeves and have my team and I get to work for you to help you resolve workplace issues, we'll give you contact information throughout the show so that you can call and email and we can have a private chat. But let's talk about a situation that came across my desk, John, over the past few days. Uh, I spoke with a gentleman who had been uh, working the same shift, a rotating shift, sometimes it's day, sometimes it's night, sometimes called continental shifts. Uh, he's been doing that for, for years, been happy with that, no problem. Recently, he had to be off work because of a medical condition. Uh, and when he was ready to come back to work, his doctor told him that because of the medication you're taking, I don't want you for a while to work nights. You can only work days. It's going to be very unsafe for you to work nights. Don't want you to do that. And the doctor gave him a doctor's note saying, this person for the next three months can only work days and will evaluate again after three months. He did the right thing, this employee. He gave that note to his employer. And his employer said, no, <laughs> we can't do that. Think about everyone else. Everyone else is going to get upset. Everyone else is also going to want to only work days. So we can't just make special arrangements for you. So we're not going to allow that. You have to work rotating shifts. And if you can't, that's OK. But you're going to be off work until that happens. So upset and, and concerned, he called me. And he wanted to understand his rights. So I, I shook my head vigorously when I heard that because this employer dropped the ball. It's illegal what this employer is doing. This person has a medical condition, has a doctor's note saying that he needs to be accommodated. His employer now has the legal obligation to accommodate. They have to find a way to allow him to work days for the three months or for however long his doctor says. It doesn't matter what other headaches they may create, and it doesn't matter if they may upset other employees that also want to work days. They're not doing that because they like him better. They're doing that because they have a legal obligation to accommodate based on his medical condition. So this employer has breached the Human Rights Code. It's illegal. They cannot do that. Okay, and if they continue along this path, there's going to be significant repercussions. So what I told this person is this. Let me send them a quick letter reminding them of their legal obligation. I bet you anything that once they hear from me and they read that, they consult with their own lawyer, they'll realize, holy cow, yes, we have to provide that accommodation. So a reminder there for you as well, for employers and employees. If there's an employee that requires medical accommodation, as long as you have that doctor's note, your employer has to find a way to make it happen. Otherwise, again, that's illegal. That's a really weak excuse. I mean, you know, everyone else will want Well, not everybody else is sick. That's the reason why I need it. I mean, it's silly. But is there, 
Is there a threshold? I guess it would depend on the size of the company and their resources as far as the accommodation is concerned. Is that realistic? Sure, yeah. At some point, the type of accommodation that the person needs is just going to be too extreme, too much. So, for example, this person, if they need accommodation that they can only work in 30-degree uh, weather, but the office is located in northern Ontario where it's cold, well, that's not going to be possible. The employer is not going to have to move their facilities to a warmer climate. That's extreme, of course, but I think you know where I'm getting with that. So the point is, we call this accommodation to the point of undue hardship. What that means is that you're, you have to be accommodated, even if it's difficult, as long as it's not so difficult, so unreasonable, that it creates undue hardship on the employer. The problem is, in most cases, I've seen this for years and years, that the employer says, no, no, this is too hard before it actually is. And that is a human rights violation. EmploymentLawyer.ca, there's a good website for you to go to. You can search around there, find the radio shows that Lior and I do pretty much across the country. have been doing those for years. Tons of phone calls every week. We love getting you on the air. And who knows, maybe if you call in, your, uh, your call may appear on this show as well. We'll get to one right now, Lior, from our radio show. I've been working for a manufacturing company for the past five and a half years. Three months ago, it was bought out by a company. There's lots of rumors sort of flying around that there's going to be layoffs. One of the executive administrative assistants told me that the executives have been looking into buyout packages. And what do you do? What kind of job? I work in the, in the office for the executives. And how old are you? I'm 36. This is actually a fairly common situation. You kind of hear through the grapevine that there may be changes, that people are going to be let go, and you're always wondering, wait a second, are they going to offer me a good package? What am I really owed? So you have to actually inform yourself with that information, even if you think there's a chance that you're going to be let go. May as well find out what is the value. What is severance for you? And one easy, easy, easy way to do that is you go, you, you grab your smartphone, your tablet, your desktop, and you go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca because there we have our severance calculator tool that's been used by over 2 million people. And that allows you to calculate the amount of severance that you're owed in seconds. It's free, it's anonymous. There's no reason why you don't go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, whether you're staring at that severance letter or whether you think that may be coming down. So you have to check that out. And let's then apply to this situation. We heard the call from our radio show. We know that this person has worked there for a while. She's concerned about the severance package. Let's see how much severance she is actually owed. I'm actually going to take her information and plug it into our severance calculator at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. And let's see what that gives us. So she's an executive assistant, been there for five and a half years. She's 36 years of age. We don't know yet how much severance she's going to be offered, but now she knows that what she's actually owed is six to eight months of severance, six to eight months. So now she knows that. And if and when she is let go and she's staring at that severance letter, if it's less than that, she knows there's a problem. You could do the same thing at home, even if you're just concerned or curious about how much you'd be owed, Go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, use the severance calculator, you'd be glad you did. You know, it's, it's interesting with that last screen you put up, you always talk about the different facets and different things that go into creating that severance offer and why it's this much or why it's that much. Five and a half years, six to eight months severance, that's pretty good, but executive assistant, she's got a reasonably high level job, that's one of the factors, right? Absolutely, executive assistant is different than someone who may be in a lower level position, not the same as someone who is in a management position necessarily. So the, the type of job that you have does impact your severance. The more senior a position you have in terms of responsibility, in terms of management, even in terms of income, it's going to have an upwards impact on your severance. Terminationquestions.com, that is the website that was built just for you to ask questions online. Again, like everything else, it's free and anonymous. You can use that at your leisure. Want to get to one. Before we get into a break here, Lior, the uh, question is, I've been on, a, on the receiving end, rather, of many comments from coworkers and a manager about my impending retirement. I have no plans to retire in the immediate future. Can I be forced out of my job? So this is not an unusual situation. You and I have talked about this in the past. I've even told you a story about uh, a client of my former client that had his uh, brochures left on his desk about retirement homes and then golf resorts, yeah. all in a way to encourage him to retire. So before we even talk about can you be forced to retire, by the way, you can't, but before right. we even talk about that, let's talk about the fact that it's completely inappropriate to try to tell you that you should retire, to suggest that you should retire, to maybe suggest that you're too old to do the job. Oh, come on, why would you want to be here with these young kids, you should retire. That alone is improper because it's going to make it uncomfortable for you. It's going to tell you you're not wanted, you're not appreciated. 
And that alone can be a constructive dismissal, just by giving you those hints, those nudges. So you may be able to treat that as a termination and a human rights violation just by being pushed out that way. So if you're that, in that situation, you should tell your employer, no, I'm not retiring. Please, I'm not comfortable with this. Stop talking to me about this. I don't appreciate that. You can do that and you should do that and, and that should be the end of it. Now to the actual question, can you be forced to retire? Of course not. We used to have mandatory retirement in Canada. That's now gone. It's been gone for many years. Now, as the law stands, you can work till 65, 75, or whatever age that you want, and no one can decide if or when you retire, either than you, the individual. You can work as long as you want to, and no one else can do anything else to you, and if they even try, we're talking human rights violation. What if you get fired for that reason? That's what you're talking about. Ah, you're too old. Out you go. Out you go. Human rights violation, age yeah. discrimination. We have an aging workforce and an aging population, and unfortunately, I've been seeing it too often these days where employers are, are pushing employees out of there. They're trying to suggest that they shouldn't be there, that the age is a factor, or they're trying to mask the reason for termination as something else, not legal human rights violation. Constructive dismissal, true or false, is coming up next. We'll stick around for it. In the meantime, 1 855 821 5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca is how you get a hold of the R. And we'll be right back with that true or false. Stand by. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for cause terminations are false, and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. If your long-term disability claim is denied, should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you are playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't. That's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with The Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. It is the Employment Law Show. John Scholes with Lior Sanfiru. Best part of the show, it's a constructive dismissal, true or false, because I don't have to do it. I get to ask the questions. By the way, you want to reach out after the show anytime, 1-855-821-5900. You can also go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Great website, full of information, free, anonymous, and the severance calculator there as well. Number one, Lior, constructive dismissal occurs when an employer implements a fundamental change to an employee's position without consent. True or false? That is the exact yep. definition, John, of a constructive dismissal. So that is absolutely true. So we know what a regular dismissal is. A dismissal is a situation you walk in, you get your walking papers, the employer says goodbye, we're letting you go. That's a dismissal, okay? Uh, we call that a regular termination, a regular dismissal. A constructive dismissal is a situation where your employer is not telling you you're gone. Your employer is not saying today is your last day. Constructive dismissal happens when you, the employee, decide to treat your employment as being terminated because of something that your employer did. And the most common type of constructive dismissal happens because the employer changed a term of employment. They change your pay, they change your hours of work, they change your compensation scheme. That is what results in a constructive dismissal. So anytime there's a significant change, not, not every change is significant, but if there's a significant change to the terms of employment, that may give you the right to say no. That is a constructive dismissal. I am choosing to look at it as a termination, and now, employer, you have to pay me my full severance. That's what a constructive dismissal is. Very, very common. Probably the second most common issue that I deal with as an employer, employment lawyer is constructive dismissal. Constructive dismissal, true or false? Number two right now, a cut in pay will not result in a constructive dismissal if an employer is experiencing financial difficulties. I can't afford to. Pay. Well, certainly during uh, the, the pandemic, we've heard this very often. An employer right. says, well, we're struggling financially. And employers were, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to belittle that by any stretch. But does that mean that that now gives the employer the right to give someone a pay cut? You're shaking your head. You know the answer. The answer is no. It's still a constructive dismissal if your employer reduces your pay even if they're struggling financially, even if there's a legitimate reason. They may not be picking on you. They're not trying to hurt you. They're doing it for legitimate business reasons. Even then, 
It's not something they're allowed to do. They cannot reduce your pay. Now, not every single pay cut results in a constructive dismissal. You would have to be somewhere north of 10%, probably even around 15% or more, before we're talking constructive dismissal. So if they reduced your pay from $30 an hour to $29 an hour, you're not going to be happy, but probably not enough to be a constructive dismissal. But whether or not the company is struggling financially is not going to be a factor. True or false, number three, constructive dismissal. A toxic work environment and unresolved complaints of harassment can lead to constructive dismissal. True or false? That is completely true. That's 100% true. Now, we know that a significant change to the terms of employment, like a pay reduction, change in hours, results in a constructive dismissal. But another common type of constructive dismissal happens when you're a victim of workplace harassment. You're uh, being bullied in the workplace. What happens then is your work environment becomes very difficult to cope in. It's very difficult to work. It's very difficult to do your job. And because of that poison work environment, you may be able to treat your employment as being terminated. Again, constructive dismissal. So in a constructive or in a harassment situation, that term of constructive dismissal should jump to mind as well. It's always key when you're in a harassment situation to document, to have a way to prove that you're being harassed. Always assume that the person that's harassing you is not going to admit it. So how do we prove it? Do we have a recording? Do we have something in writing? Do we have a witness? If we have that, it's not difficult to establish a constructive dismissal. So give me a call if you're in that situation. We are doing our constructive dismissal, true or false, on the show this week. Number four is this temporary layoffs, unless agreed upon in an employment contract, will likely result in a constructive dismissal, true or false? Completely true. Probably one of the most common types of constructive dismissal, certainly over the pandemic. So why is a temporary layoff a constructive dismissal? Well, I've already said, and you hopefully agree with me, that a significant change to your pay is a constructive dismissal. Well, let's think about that. Isn't a temporary layoff just a 100% reduction to your pay? You used to make a salary, now you're making zero. It's a 100% reduction. So clearly, a 100% reduction is a significant reduction. That's why a temporary layoff is, in most cases, a constructive dismissal. In other words, you don't have to accept a temporary layoff. You don't have to sit at home and wait to be called back. You can choose to look at it and treat it as a termination and require your employer to pay you your severance. Now, as, as John said, the exception to that would be a situation where you signed an employment agreement that gave your employer the right to put you on a temporary layoff. Most people have not, but you always want to be mindful of that employment agreement. It may say that. Another reason why, if you're asked to sign an employment agreement or if you're starting a new job and are presented with an employment agreement, don't just go ahead and sign without understanding what you're signing, or even better, let me see it and we can talk about what it all means. All right, fifth and final question on our constructive dismissal, true or false, Lior, if significant changes have been made to your job, you should resign first and then talk to an employment lawyer after. Well, that is false because that is putting the cart before the horse. So if you believe you've been constructively dismissed, yes, you can resign. But let's first talk before you resign. Let's make sure that it is, in fact, a constructive dismissal, that you're not jumping the gun. And let's talk about how to resign, when to resign. What do we say when we resign? We want to do that all so we can preserve the constructive dismissal case. Now, listen, if you've already resigned, okay, it's done. We can't go back. Call me. We'll deal with it. It'll be fine. But if I have my choice in terms of advising you is if you think you've been constructively dismissed, before you hand in your letter of resignation and say, that's it, I'm out of here, let's talk about that. Let's understand how we should do that. Let's have a strategy in place. You'll be glad you did. You got them all right. Nicely done, sir. Whew. Uh, I'm quite relieved. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Uh, again, uh, let's get to this another phone call. Employmentlawyer.ca is the website you want to go to and go to the Knowledge Center drop down media. That's where you're going to find a radio station somewhere across the country where we do a show. And our second call for the day is coming up now. My daughter and was diagnosed with cancer. She had surgery, then got COVID. She went back to work for two weeks and then they because her surgery, they didn't think they got it all. They went back in and did surgery, and her employer has now tried to fire her because she has taken too many days off of work. That's nasty. That, yeah. you, you know what? I mean, forget about being a, a lawyer and forget about law for a second. Yeah. I mean, that's just wrong on, on a humane level, on a human level. It's wrong. You, you, you're struggling. You have a medical condition. Cancer, well, you've been gone for too long. No. No, 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 can't do that. Remember what I've said before on this show, on a previous show, and most shows, is you can be off 
as long as you need to, if you have a doctor supporting you, if you have a doctor's note, and God knows having cancer and even having COVID, of course, but you know, cancer is a serious medical condition. You need to be off as long as you need to be, as long as your doctor says, as long as you're working on getting better. And your employer can't impose a timeline, can't fire you because you're sick. That's illegal. We're talking human rights violation. We're talking potentially employment standards violation. We're talking wrongful dismissal. You name it, wrong, wrong, wrong. So I, I, it, it's terrible to hear these stories. Unfortunately, I've, I hear them way too often and more than I should. So if you find yourself in that situation, your friend, your family members, uh, whatever it is, you have them call me, okay? I'll deal with it. I'll make sure that the right thing happens here because you cannot and should never be punished for being sick. That call from one of our long-running radio shows. I want to get to another one, but we've got to take a short break, and we'll do that right now and return with more. The Employment Law Show, stand by. People think contractors aren't owed severance. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just gonna walk away. Your insurer may ignore you. They may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks' pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Employment Law Show, a few minutes to go. Thank you for, uh, for hanging on. You want to reach out after the show to Lior and his team. Here's the phone number, 1-855-821-5900. Email is help at employmentlawyer.ca or the website that's constructed just to educate you and help you out. Free and anonymous, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. I mentioned the phone call from one of our long-running radio shows, Lior. That'll be our third phone call from the day. Let's get to it right now. I work in sales. In the last couple of months, our accounting department has been very understaffed. My workplace has now made it a rule that if we don't assist accounting by, you know, adjusting invoices and doing all these things, we will not get paid and they deduct our paycheck set work that we've never had to do. And I've been there for a decade. Wow. That's just wrong, John. That's wrong. Listen, th there's one very basic concept in employment law and that is you get paid for working yeah so if you do a job if you go to work you have to get paid for it and your employer doesn't get to withhold your pay ever there are actually no circumstances where your employer gets to say we're withholding the pay even if they're not happy with you even if they think you should have done more or should have done better they still cannot withhold your pay there's no way that can ever ever happen now in this particular situation it sounds actually forget about withholding pay actually sounds like we may be talking about constructive dismissal we talked about constructive dismissal earlier on the show but a situation where you keep getting more work and more work and, and being told to do more and more and more and more hours, that's a change to the terms of employment. That could absolutely be a constructive dismissal because the job you used to have is no longer the job that you have. They've added things, they've made a different job. You may be able to treat those additional responsibilities as constructive dismissal. But even if you don't do that, you do your best, you come into work, the company says you should have done five things instead of the three and a half that you did, no, they cannot withhold your pay. That is so illegal, I don't even know where to begin. That alone, by the way, can also be a constructive dismissal. They're not paying as they're supposed to. That can also be a situation that they get fined by the Ministry of Labor. So it's wrong, it's illegal. If you're ever, and let's make this as a rule, if you're ever not getting paid, for whatever reason, maybe your employer is saying, well, we don't have money to pay you, or your employer is saying, we don't think you did a good job, so we're not going to pay you, you call me. Always without exception because that's never ever going to be legal. Terminationquestions.com, there's a website for you, a uh, opportunity for you anytime online to ask questions and maybe it'll appear on the show at a later date. Here's one for today. Lior says, my father worked as a painter for 30 years. He was let go last year without explanation or severance pay. They said he was an independent contractor, but he always used the company truck, tools, etc., and was told where and when to work. Is he not entitled to severance? 
John, you had me at 30 years, yeah. okay? Honestly, that's all that I needed to know at yeah. that point because you do not, I, let, let's be clear, you do not work somewhere for 30 years and not be an employee. It's actually not possible. If you're gonna work somewhere for 30 years, you, of course you're an employee, you're not a contractor. So this guy clearly has been um, uh, completely misclassified. Yeah. And this happens often. Someone is misclassified as a contractor when they are really an employee. So if you have a regular job, you go to work, you do the job that you're told to do, you come back the next day, you do the same thing, you are an employee. It does not matter what you call yourself. It doesn't matter how you pay your taxes. It doesn't matter what the company says you are, and it doesn't matter what piece of paper you may have signed. Ultimately, if it looks like an employee and acts like an employee, guess what? It's an employee. And that's why it's so important that you understand that concept. Now, in this person, in this case, not only was he there for 30 years, I would stop right there, but he drove the company truck, he did what he was told, he is an employee. Yeah. Now, why am I harping on this? Why is it important to understand if you're an employee or a contractor? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, if you're an employee, you have the rights of an employee. That means you have the right to vacation pay and holiday pay and overtime because you are an employee. Contractor doesn't have that, but if you've been misclassified, you have that, and you could be owed that over a long period of time. But just as important as if you're let go, you're owed severance like an employee. And a, a contractor, an independent contractor, doesn't really get severance. An employee, we know that, absolutely does. So let's go back to this particular situation. Mm -hmm. We know, we've established that this person, as a painter for 30 years, was an employee. He's let go. How much is he owed? Well, very easy. Let's go back to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Let's use our severance calculator and let's see exactly how much he's owed. 30 years of employment, my gosh, as a painter, I don't know his age, let's say he's in his 50s. Well, you can see that he's owed as much as 24 months pay. 24 months because he is an employee. That's how easy it is and for you at home as well. If you're let go and the company says, we're not paying you severance because you're not an employee, you're a contractor, chances are, you probably have been misclassified. And by the way, I mentioned pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. We have a tool there that allows you to find out if you're an employee or a contractor. So before you even calculate your severance, you can actually go through that analysis and find out contractor or employee. Remember, employees that have been misclassified get severance, get full severance as much as 24 months pay. Outside of the question of severance, what if you know, anybody watching is going, yeah, but Lior, I got this agreement with my boss for 20 years. You know, I file my own taxes. I come and go as I please, blah, blah, blah. And he pays me the same thing every week. What does it matter what I call myself? Well, what, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. and Because <laughs> you don't get to decide. I don't get to decide what you are. Because if it was that simple, everyone can be a contract. You would just hang, up, uh, hang out a sign saying I'm a contractor, and you're a contractor. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Why can't the, the people working uh, at a part-time uh, at a restaurant or in a factory or people you're working as assistants in an office, why can't they all be contractors? Well, they're not because they're employees. They have regular jobs, and the law makes that determination. Yeah. I don't decide that. The company doesn't decide that. Income tax doesn't decide that. Employment law decides that. So if you have a regular job for a period of time, you are likely an employee, and that means you have the rights of an employee, you've been misclassified. If you're not sure, I mentioned already pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, you can also call me, we can ask, I can ask you a few questions, and I can tell you, yes, you're an employee, or no, you're not. Because CRA would love to get a hold of you after 30 years if you think you were a contractor, right? That could be uh, fines, it yeah. could be penalties. You don't want to be on the wrong side of CRA, so yeah, yeah, do it right. We are done for the day. Thank you for all your contributions, whether you wrote in or made a phone call during one of our radio shows. You can continue to do so. It might be on a future show. I'll leave you some contact information to get a hold of the or 1-855-821-5900. That's the phone number. Email is help at employmentlawyer.ca and always, always pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. We'll catch you next time on the Employment Law Show. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca. Discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed.